because the, they learned that the consequence wasn't worth it. Correct. That's what teaches, right? Mm -hmm. And when we use humor, when, when appropriate, sometimes it's not, but we use empathy and consequences and we make the decision, the bad guy, not the person. Mm -hmm. That's when learning can take place. If you keep them in the fight or flight, mad, emotional state, no learning takes place. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to The Lost Art of Parenting, where we educate, encourage, and entertain you. If you're a parent, we want you to know that you have people on your side who are willing to coach and encourage and hopefully make you laugh on occasion in this never-ending journey of being a parent. <laughs> First and foremost, I am Dr. Douglas Peak here, and our co-host who is serving alongside me, who has all the principles and techniques that you need to learn, is Kim Cross. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It's good to have you, and we're so glad that you're all listening today. We want you to be more effective. <laughs> we want you to be more confident as a parent. And that happens only when you develop your skills and you grow in wisdom. We want you to parent uh, with less stress and confusion. We want you to be able to enjoy it, don't we? Absolutely. You should enjoy being a parent. It's a huge part of your job and it's an important job. And as you sharpen your parenting skills and you get your values laid out, it really makes it enjoyable. It does because you are confident and competent. You're not confused. You're not as stressed. You know what you're doing. You have a goal. You have a purpose. And that should be fun. They're your kids. Yeah. And you know that you're investing in launching them as the great adults. It's, it's a legacy. Yeah, yeah. You're leaving a legacy. So we have been kind of on the topic uh, over these last few podcasts on the four critical needs of children. And if you are a parent and you're aware of these four critical needs, it makes a massive difference in how to establish the right goals, clarifying your values and learning the skills. So give us once again, what are the four critical needs? Sense of security, mm -hmm. a sense of unconditional love and affection, sense of belonging, and then a healthy amount of control. Yeah. Okay. And so we've talked about a number of these different things. What are we going to talk about today? Yeah, we, we went into depth and security. And when we went into depth last time, um, identifying and defining it and giving you sk skills and tips. And today we're going to dive into the deeper part of unconditional love and affection. All right. Well, let's start off and get a working definition. So if you're a parent, what does it mean to love your kids unconditionally? Does it mean that you just let them do whatever they want? Do you always praise them and never correct them and never say no? What exactly is unconditional love? Well, if we did what you just said, we'd, we'd raise some pretty unhappy entitled kids. Yes. So no. <laughs> that, so we'll start with what it isn't. <laughs> okay. Let's start with what okay. it is not. So unconditional love is not based on um, expectations or behavior requirements of your kid or that they use certain words or actions with you or that they, quote, measure up to your expectations in some way. So you know you're not loving your kids with unconditional love if you have a lot of expectations, they don't measure up, and you get mad at them a lot. Correct. Or it's based on a certain grade point average or performance level or appearance. Those are all things that are going to set you up for disappointment and failure. And it's not what we want to focus on with our children. Okay. So unconditional love means there are no strings attached mm -hmm. and there's no exceptions. We love you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean we excuse the behavior, Correct. but we love who you are. Yeah. It's, it's loving the essence of the person. You're our child. You're created by God. We, we love you and, and you will never lose our love based on mistakes you make or how you look or how you perform or GPAs or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it's unconditional. There's no way to lose that love. Okay? Yeah, and it comes from an expectation, I think, based on how you value your children. If you value your children as, well, they have to perform at a certain level or I'm not, you know, happy or if they have to fulfill my 
dreams that I, yeah, yeah, or my dreams that I didn't get to do when I was a kid. You know, you live vicariously through your kids, maybe in sports or something else, or you get angry with them, you shame them. You know, one of the things that I think is really important to understand is unconditional love says, this is who you are. I love you. Uh, you did that and that was wrong or you made that mistake and that's not who you are. Uh, I think a really great way to exemplify this is let's say your kid comes home. They don't do on a test. Well, on a test, you don't say you're a failure. You're a bad person. You're right. a bad. Yeah. Right. You're stupid. You don't say those things. Cause that's saying I can only love you on conditions. Correct. But if, so what would be a better way to say it? They come home and you're saying like, well, I want to love my kid. So do I just say, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Or how, what's the best way to say, I love you, but failing the test because you were lazy and didn't study isn't going to cut the mustard. Right. <laughs> so I kind of back up and I look at it as we need to make sure that as parents, we understand that kids are going to fail. Kids okay. are going to make mistakes. Kids have weaknesses and shortcomings. Guess what? So do we, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So negative things don't change our love for them. They're opportunities to course correct. They're opportunities to teach as a parent and to learn as a child. So when my kids came home, if they did uh, less on a report card than they were capable of doing, mm -hmm. I would just ask them, how did you feel about your grades? And put it back on them. They're their grades. They're not yeah. mine, yeah. right? And then I would ask, what would you do differently next time? Mm -hmm. And it was still, we love you. We may not agree with or like the results of something. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't either, but you're still you and you have an opportunity to learn and do better. Yeah. So if I'm a parent and I want to apply unconditional love principles to my actual parenting, what things could I do? So I look at number one, you need to accept the child no matter what, but that doesn't involve agreement with what they've done. Mm -hmm. And then there's accountability. Mm -hmm. So we, you, you mentioned that a little bit, right? Yeah. You don't just let them have everything they want and get away with whatever they want to. That's yeah. And I think it's really failure. important to understand uh, psychologists have pointed this out is that if you are a permissive parent that takes draws no boundaries, you're actually communicating to that child that they have no value, that you don't care. You don't love, love them. them. Mm -hmm. You don't love them. Correct. Yeah. So it's very important to have accountability, agreement, and acceptance. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How, how, how would you communicate ex acceptance, acceptance to your child? Yeah. Right. So I love and, inv and value and accept you and your opinions. So I see you, I hear you, I value your thoughts and your beliefs and your opinions. I value you as a person. Um, I want to communicate that to you often and I want us to communicate often. However, I don't necessarily agree with your opinions because mm -hmm. opinions aren't necessarily based on fact, right? Yeah, yeah. So opinions and beliefs can be based on immaturity, faulty thinking, emotions, um, lack of experience. And again, you know, it's, it's not true. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've got to talk about the validity and the truth of those beliefs and opinions. And regardless of beliefs and opinions, I still accept you. Yeah. So we may not agree, but I still love you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing too, that's so important is you're modeling that they can care about other people or love other people, friends, and not agree with all their opinions that you, you don't want your child growing up with the assumption that they have to be in full agreement with the most important people in their lives. Otherwise they're not, you know, accepted that that's a dangerous place to put oh, a kid. That's them trying to be you and they're mm -hmm. not being themselves. And we all have different gifts and strengths and talents mm -hmm. and we need to be who we are. So knowing thyself is one of the most important things we can do. Yeah. Know thyself. So acceptance is important. What about agreement? What, how does agreement work? Well, so agreement means I may not agree with you. And as your parent, I'm responsible legally, ethically, and morally for you. Mm -hmm. And if you are 10 years old or 15 years old, and I'm 30 or 40 years old, whatever the age gap is, I have a lot more experience and wisdom. So as your parent, I need to be your executive function and sometimes your safety monitor, mm -hmm. <laughs> your decision maker. And whether we agree or not, it has to be my decision as your parent, because I'm, I'm responsible for you. Mm -hmm. And when we go back to the brain that matures for females in the late twenties and males, even longer, mm -hmm. 
a 10 year old or a 15 year old may not have a good opinion or belief or a safe um, plan of action. And Mm -hmm. we need to step in. Yeah. And I think what's really important is when your kids, uh, particularly when they get older, I'm not trying to seek agreement. You know, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, like you said, is communicate that we need to do it this way. And so you don't have to agree with everything, but because I'm responsible, I'm, we're going to do it this way. And that the relationship is still the most important thing. Right. It's not what we disagree over necessarily, mm-hmm. but we have to keep that relationship positive and healthy and intact because that's going to carry us through a lot of conflict and disagreement in the future. Yeah. But in the end, it's the relationship that counts. But how do you do that? How do you maintain the relationship while holding somebody accountable? Because very few people like to hold other people accountable for anything because our Mm -hmm. society has trained people to be unaccountable. And if someone holds you accountable, you know, you call them a Karen or you call them a Chad or you call them this or a hater or this (laughs) or that or the other. And basically that's a real uh, a societal way of people saying, I want to be able to do whatever I want without any accountability. That's so right. how, how do you maintain the relationship and a high level of accountability at the same time with your children? So it comes back to your job. So your job as a parent is to teach them love, to keep them safe, to teach them right from wrong, to pe- teach them independent life skills, values, all those mm-hmm. things. So if my job is to teach you right from wrong, that includes accountability for your actions because that's how you're going to learn right from wrong. Mm-hmm. So I still love you. We can have a healthy, respectful relationship, but you're still going to be accountable. So how we do that is how we discipline. There's a difference between consequences and punishment. Mm -hmm. Punishment says, I'm going to make you pay. Mm -hmm. I'm in control of you. I have all the power. Um, You don't have any. And I'm going to hold you accountable in a very negative, punitive manner, as opposed to, hey, let's make your mistake or your decision the bad guy instead of you or me. Yeah. Let's focus on what you did, not who you are. So focus on fixing the problem, not trying to label or punish or change or alter the person. So, yeah, I think one uh, story that I can tell about this is kind of funny is when uh, my two oldest, Zach and Mackenzie, were probably 10 or 12 years old. We had a thing in our house is that, uh, you know, the parents cooked the meal. And then after the meal, we always ate dinner together at the same time every night, six o'clock. And the kids were supposed to be there. And so what would happen is one of them would have to set the table and clear the table. So they'd set the table and then they cleared the table. So they took all the dirty dishes and put them over Mm -hmm. by the sink or in the sink. And then they put all the food away. And then the other person would have to do the dishes, basically rinse them all off and load the dishwasher and start the dishwasher. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not very difficult. Sounds like my house. (laughs) So very similar. So what happened is they decided uh, for some reason, I don't know, they got in a big tiff about, well, I always do this and you never do that. Da da da. And so I cleared the table. No, you didn't. I'm this not clearing the fair. table. It's not fair. And so they got in this big tiff with each other and it was more about them uh, against each other. And so <clears throat> I, I was like, Kim was, my wife was getting a little bothered by the fact that they were arguing, you know, and she's like, I don't want arguing. I want them to get along. And I said, so I, I approached it and I said, okay, since you two can't figure out who's going to do what, cause they both got intractable. It's like, well, I'm not clearing the table. I'm not doing the dishes. So they stood there in the kitchen. They stonewalled. For 50, yeah, for 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> Nothing's going on. And I said, okay, since you guys can't decide, here's the consequences. As I said, you both have to clear the table and you both have to do the dishes at the same time. That kind of placated them a little bit. And I said, and you have to hold hands while you're doing it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, that was not that. Oh, my daughter just about died. You know, she's 10 and boys have cooties and it's her brother. Ah! So she actually went into the closet and she got a ski glove and put it on her hand. (laughs) And, and so here, this huge conflict, and then it just started becoming really funny. You know, they're laughing at each other. They're holding hands. And I would say, Oh, oh, you let go. You got to hold hands. (laughs) So they're trying to clear the table and they were trying to figure out how do you clear a plate with gloves on. Yeah. With a, you're holding somebody's hand. So basically you only have one usable hand, right? So one person has to hold the plate under the water and the other person has to take the brush and scrape it off. 
right? So they had to figure that out. And so, and I'll tell you, after that, they never had a problem figuring out who was going to do what. Because the, they learned that the consequence wasn't worth it. Correct. That's what teaches, right? Mm -hmm. And when we use humor, when, when appropriate, sometimes it's not, but we use empathy and consequences and we make the decision, the bad guy, not the person. Mm -hmm. That's when learning can take place. If you keep them in the fight or flight, mad emotional state, no learning takes place. Yeah. And now they have to defer their anger to something or someone. And it usually is back to the parent or to a sibling and we're not, we're not teaching or learning. It's not good. So unconditional love and power can coexist, yeah. right? Yeah, talk about that a little bit, because I think people don't get that in our society today, particularly parents. Yeah. So I talk about correct the behavior, right? You stop the mm -hmm. behavior if they've done something wrong or point out what's, what the mistake or the, the bad decision was. You provide, you, you, you teach what's correct. Then you give them another opportunity to succeed. So they get to have that opportunity to try it again. Okay. Okay. And then you reconnect with them and that bond is, is back in place. I call it course correction. Parenting is constant teaching and constant course correction because when they learn, let's say certain things by age five, well, age six brings on a whole new set of learning, yes, right? It always is a new thing. Oh, and then adolescence and then yes. teen. I mean, it's constant. And we as adults have to admit we're constantly learning too. Yeah. And what, what, this is very important about uh, power and unconditional love, because I know a lot of moms, right? That you, you grew up in a household, maybe didn't have a good model of how this worked. Right. And then you, uh, you're a very, you might be a very sensitive uh, mom, a very sensitive person, very loving, very accepting. You have lots of friends. You said that, and then you and your husband have a child, you know, and this child is like a strong willed child. Right. Um, you might have a little boy or you might have a little girl. We call it compliant or defiant kids. Yeah, okay. Compliant or defiant. You have a defiant one who's, mm -hmm. you know, who's like four years old, five years old. And you think, man, that child is a force of nature. What do I do now? Like, what do I do now? And <laughs> I, I think what's really, I think what a lot of moms will do is they make a, a deal with themselves and they kind of like, well, I can't, I, you know, it's so hard, the conflict. It's so hard. The I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to hurt their feelings. So in the end, they'll grow up and maybe I'll make mistakes and at least they'll know I love them. Right. So they, and, and what's interesting is I'm like, please don't make that deal. Don't make that deal because what you're going to communicate in the end is not love. Right. And what you, cause you have to realize is that you love them. And because you love them, you have to show them who is the boss. You have to do that. Now you don't get into power plays all the time. And there's all, we'll, we'll talk later on about all the techniques, right? You know, you give them choices, you do this. You, we'll get into parenting styles and the impact that yes. has what you, what the result you end up with. Right. Yeah, But don't make the assumption or don't make the deal that, well, I'll, I'll just love them and give up the parenting because the parenting is just too hard. Right. Or the opposite happens where you're just on them all the time, Correct. very demanding, very authoritative, and the relationship goes down the hill. Yeah. The two can be together. Kids respect parents who are both loving and powerful. Mm -hmm. If you're just loving, you're not going to get good results Correct. and they're not prepared for the real world. If you're just powerful, you're going to lose the relationship and they'll never want to see you again. Yeah. You have to put the two together and we'll talk more about that in the future. There's yes. some very specific ways to navigate that. Well, let's talk about, uh, <laughs> you know, because whether you're, you have a three-year-old or you have a 13-year-old, you know, this notion of how do I communicate un uh, unconditional love, accountability and agreement and love all at the same time is through communication. You yes. know, the words we use, it's our actions will follow what we're saying, mm -hmm. obviously. So what are some of the things that we can do to be better communicators of unconditional love and accountability agreement, all of these things together? First of all, I tell parents, you should be speaking to your child with respect and commanding respect back because mm -hmm. that's the foundation. You wouldn't talk to one of your friends, friends disrespectfully. So you shouldn't do that with your kids either. Okay. You are role modeling constantly how you talk to them and that's how they're going to talk to you. Right. The second thing is we want to be as positive as we can, but as truthful as we can also, we're not mm -hmm. going to sugarcoat it, but we're not going to constantly criticize and be negative. Thirdly, we need to listen and ask questions more than we talk. 
Because if you want to teach kids to listen, you need to be listening, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And they need to feel like their opinions matter, that they are valued, they're seen and heard. So there are certain things in communication, and Gottman does a lot of work in this with mm-hmm. marriages. There are four what he calls communication or relationship killers. Mm. And they are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Mm. So I think we need to unpack those a little bit. So criticism means you're constantly pointing out what they're doing wrong, constantly pointing out how where they fall short. Nobody likes that, right? But Correct. sometimes we have to give feedback, and, and we mm-hmm. get that. We, we do a, a teaching or a correction. But if you focus on the problem and not the person, that is not so personal, and you mm-hmm. can be a little bit more positive. So mm-hmm. we, we need to curb that criticism. The second one is defensiveness. And what happens is if we don't assume the best and we are very critical or we're pointing things out all the time, that makes people feel backed up into a corner, feel like they don't measure up and and they do get defensive. How about if we ask questions instead of make assumptions, mm-hmm. right? And that kids appreciate that. Mm-hmm. The third one, and this is going to resonate with marriages, I'm sure, but it works with, with any kind of communication with kids is stonewalling. And the definition of that is you shut down, you stop communicating, you don't talk, Mm. and things get real quiet. And in that gap, uh, we get a lot of pulling away. Um, It starts to marinate and fester and get worse. It's it's really a a bad tool to use to try to, quote, win the argument. It just Mm -hmm. makes it worse. But those things will, will damage communication relationships. But when you get to contempt, where you don't care, you show disgust, you are sarcastic, you completely shut them down or ignore them, that will kill a marriage or a relationship with contempt a kid. Contempt very bad, yeah. It's very bad. Well, you know, it's interesting uh, because one of the techniques that, that uh, I learned, someone taught me to do this and I did that is, you know, when my kids were little, uh, when they were probably up to about six or seven years of age, they, they were kind of in one stage of parenting and then when they got to probably that eight, nine to 10, when they got around double transition. digits, it started to transition a little bit and they would do things wrong and they'd get mischievous and they would do different types of things, you know, they that push the limit, they push the limits more. And, uh, someone said to me, they said, well, when your kid does that, you know, the, cause you know, you want to avoid these things, you know, because they do it and it's like, okay, you've been, you know, I've been raising you for 10 years and it's like, you did this on purpose. And so you can be really critical because you're annoyed, you know, it's like, Oh, you, you, you should know more. better. You should know better. Yeah. Or something <laughs> like that. So I, so what, so what someone told me to, to do, and I, that, this is what I started to do. And that is to say, okay, that's not appropriate. Go to your room. I'll be up there momentarily for us to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So they would go up to their room. Right. And then that gave me a moment, you know, I'd go out in the garage, go, why in the world would they, blah, blah, blah. you know, it's like, God, this is so annoying. You know, and I get all that out, Gives you know, a chance to calm down, calm down. Yeah. So, and then, you know, uh, not be defensive or not take it personally. And then I would go up and, you know, it could be anywhere from, you know, 10 minutes, you know, they're in their room and they're waiting to longer. And, and then I would employ your techniques, you know, okay, so why did, why, Why'd you do that? How'd you feel about doing that? Do you feel that that's appropriate? You know, asking questions, right? asking them questions and getting yeah. them to work through it. But later on, when my kids grew up and became adults, they were telling me how that waiting period was pure torture. torture. <laughs> Cause they're forced to think about it. Right? Yeah, and and then, they're isolated from you. Yeah. And they're like, we just, you know, it's like we, we created up all these horrific punishments that, you know, or this or that, what's he going to do? And most of the time, you know, you just go up, you talk about it and say, and then I always ask this question too. And that was, is okay. You know, that it's something we don't do. And you did that. What do you think your punishment should be? And I would use the word consequence. Or there. consequence, yeah. 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 What, yeah. Very good. Nice correction. Yeah, there. <laughs> See, you're so good at this. No, it's just. That's good coaching, been, right? I'm doing the, it a That's long called time. coaching on the fly. On the fly. <laughs> Say, what do you think your consequence should be? You know, yeah. and then it's so funny because after a while, they would pick consequences that were way worse, way worse <laughs> than yep. I would ever come up with. Yep. yep. And so I'd always back it off a little bit, you know, well, okay. That's we, we're not going to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're not grounded yeah. for life. Yeah. We're yeah. not going to take all food and sustenance away for a week. <laughs> no, you're not fasting. No. 
But you know, you know that's, that's respectful communication. And part of that is the tone you use. So you mentioned yeah. cooling off. I said to my son one time, I said, I'm so angry. I'm afraid of what I might say. Yeah. And I want to go and cool off and think about it so I don't say something I regret. Yeah. And he was like, wow. But that's role modeling. Mm-hmm that I can time myself out as the adult. We often say, do you remove the adult, the child, or the offending object? And sometimes we remove the adult. Yeah, the adult must be removed. And then listening and asking questions as opposed to yelling and anger. Yelling and anger will put a kid in fight or flight and destroy your relationships all day long. And then you're role modeling. Hey, when it comes to conflict, conflict, we should yell and scream at each other. Yeah. That, that's not the message we should be giving at all. And right? I think uh, another technique that's really important about this in communication, uh, communicating unconditional love, agreement, and uh, accountability and all these types of things is you've really got to hone your active listening skills. And your conflict management tools. Yeah, because we would we would sit, and a lot of our conversations always happened around dinner time. Yes. Right? So we'd have dinner, and we ate dinner at the same time every night. The kids would sit down, and I was always there, and I would start the dinner, you know. I As the, as the husband and father, I would pray and start, and then I would say, well, how was your day? And then they would say, you know, fine, well, when they were younger, they loved to talk, you know, right. well, they want to tell you everything, you know, and then they get older and they're like, fine. You have to ask more specific yeah. questions. You gotta, yeah. you gotta really, <laughs> but what was interesting is sometimes, you know, the mom it might ask a question about an accountability question, you know, did you get blank done or something? And then you could see the emotional stuff. And, and so that's when we had to learn to, they would say, well, I was really busy today and I didn't get my homework done and da, 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 da. So you're saying that you were feeling overwhelmed because you were really busy and blah, 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 blah. Good. Identify the emotion. Mm -hmm. And so, because I wanted them to know, I'm hearing what you're saying, right? Empathy. Yeah. I'm hearing what you're saying. Now, inside, I'm thinking, that's the dumbest excuse (laughs) I've ever heard in my life, but... (laughs) <laughs> I'm saying I hear what you're saying. So yes. instead of like jumping to the solution, but that really makes a huge difference with, you know, like nine, 10 and 11 year olds have excuses for why they didn't do what they needed to do that are just crazy. But they're, they're legit in their little mind. And right? Yeah. And so by repeating back to them what they're saying, I found two things happen. One is they feel, oh, mom is that dad, dad is listening to me, da da da. But then sometimes when you say it back, you can see this light bulb go off in their head like that's probably the dumbest thing I've ever said. <laughs> which is good, which means they own it. So they you're own not it. you're not lecturing, you're not yelling, yeah. you're not shaming, guilting, bribing, punishing. All those things don't work. That's not how yeah. kids learn. Yeah. They learn through experience and role modeling and empathy and consequences. Mm -hmm. So you kind of employed all those. So nice job. But when we can identify an emotion, Mm -hmm. oftentimes we're not sure. And I always tell parents, if you're not sure, guess. If you, oh, you look really upset. No, I'm embarrassed. They'll correct you. Yeah. And if you're correct, they'll go, yeah. And now they feel empathy. Empathy is a very powerful tool. It brings us together. It diffuses emotion. They know that they're seen and heard and valued Mm -hmm. unconditionally, right? And that helps soften that consequence that's now going to come, but they're still held accountable. Yeah. And I I think we do this in the physical realm. We need to do it in the emotional realm. And that is, is that um, like uh, my daughter was tragically bitten on the face by a dog Mm -hmm. when she was like five years old. I remember that. And so it was really, really traumatic. And so... Uh, the thing is, is that it was a strange dog and we didn't have a dog at that time. We didn't know anything about dogs and she went up to hug the dog, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? You want to teach your kid, don't ever hug a dog, you know, put your arms around a dog and have their face next to your face that you don't know. Um, but we didn't have that conversation with her right away. No, it's the first, first thing we did empathy. was, ta- yeah, ta- we were here to take care of you and make sure you're okay. Right. And I think when kids uh, have conflicts or difficulties or problems, like they would come home and they'd say, well, this went wrong on the playground or I got a ride, ride up or I got this or I got that. You know, a lot of times parents will jump to, well, what did you do? You know, what it, did you do? Right. And why'd you get in trouble? And they skip a step. They skip that step. And that is, is that your kid is emotionally wounded, just like my daughter was bit in the face. The first thing to do is to heal 
that makes that safe, you know? Show caring, show yeah. compassion, Say. show love, show wow, I hear you, you see you, yeah. I feel you. Oh, yeah. they pointed you out? What oh, was that like? So oh, were you, a, were you embarrassed? Or, uh, yeah, like you said, pick an emotion, then yeah, they mm-hmm. could talk about it. Did that make you mad? And, da, da, da. and that, that helps them heal a little bit. And then you can get to the, okay, well, maybe it wasn't a good thing to, you know, take the golf we'll club and hit the kid <laughs> over the head with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had I had to do that with my son when he had a b- black eye at age five. Yeah, I don't immediately go, what in the world happened here? It's, yeah. Let me get some ice. That must have hurt. That must have been scary. Yeah. Oh, I feel bad that this happened to you. Empathy, again, hugely underutilized, but very powerful. Very, very powerful. So, well, you know, the final thing I think that's really important to talk about just real quick is... You know, if you're using good communication techniques and active listening, it makes conflict resolution uh, so much easier. Maybe we could just talk a, about a couple of uh, steps with your kids that you could employ for conflict resolution. Oh, wow. That's a that's a big That's topic. a big one. We'll dig that's into a, it yeah. deeper in another one. I think we got to just dedicate an entire podcast to conflict resolution. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, you know, I want to wrap up with, we've covered how to meet the first two critical needs, which is security and unconditional love. Yes. Um, Next time we're going to learn about that third critical need called the sense of belonging. And I think people will be surprised at how important that is and that the true definition of a sense of belonging probably isn't what you think. Yes. And that it's connected to identity, self-esteem, confidence, perseverance, and believe it or not, academic achievement. Mm. Mm, excellent point. So, well, this is the lost art of parenting and we're glad you joined us today. That comes to the end of this uh, podcast and please subscribe, uh, give it a thumbs up. If you listen to it through an Apple device, mm-hmm. if you listen to it on a uh, Google or the, through an Android, uh, please try to give it a rating. Uh, you could also go to uh, the Foothills Church Uh, YouTube website and subscribe and then you'll get these in particular in the future. So we're glad you're here and we want you to know you've got somebody in your corner helping coach you with a few laughs along the way and how to be the best parent you can be. Absolutely. And it's a pleasure to, to share my passion and I want as many people out there as I can possibly reach to be great parents because our future depends on it. That is so true. Goodbye everyone. Thanks.